I'm going over Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and doing a homebrew breakdown of everything that this book has to offer. In this video, yes, I'm going to give you my impressions and overview of what's in this book, but I'm going to spice things up for Tasha's Cauldron Brew with some home brews of my own. What things in this book sparked my imagination that I want to take and run with? Because a lot of these ideas are great and I want to share with you guys what inspired me, show you how you can use this book for yourself if you already have it. And at the end, I'll give you my 1 to 10 rating and if you should pick this thing up for yourself if you haven't already. So if you're excited about Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and want more creative homebrew ideas for your game, then hit that subscribe button because I'm going to be posting two videos a week over this entire series for Tasha's Cauldron. I'll be sharing with you guys my own homebrew cookbook or what I'm brewing up from all this goodness. So let's get right into it and see that everything that this cauldron has brewing inside. So many brew jokes. Here it is, guys. This is everything inside of Tasha's Cauldron. It's a little after 1 a.m. right now. I've been diving through this for about an hour. I usually don't buy it on D&D Beyond, but I wanted to get this thing to you guys as soon as I could. Using this book, we got all the different chapters we talked about. I love this concept of everything's optional. When I first came to tabletop role-playing games, I thought this part was the coolest part, and it's what I've honestly done a lot with my channel about everything's optional. Even the homebrew rules I try and give you guys. Take those, twist them, they're optional. Take them, leave them, change them. I want you to do that type of stuff. Uh, on Earth Arcana, a lot of this stuff comes from Earth Arcana. And they got this cool section about 10 rules to remember, and I had to stop myself at number three with advantage and disadvantage because I do hate this even more than one factor grants you advantage or disadvantage. It only counts once. Now, yes, I agree. Multiple advantages in the form of rolling multiple D20s to where you're rolling three or four D20s, that would be dumb. But it doesn't make sense that they just wash out to just one advantage. They should add and stack on to each other. So my homebrew rule for this is every additional advantage is just a plus two added onto the roll. And I also like rules that are a little carrot dangling out in front of your players to get creative and think together and work together to try and get this role if it's really important to be as big as possible but if you feel like this advantage stacking is too much nerf the two down to one and at least give them something for working together with a little plus one each time when we play this game each of us are going to homebrew it differently or run it rules as written and that's totally fine because it's all about having fun so let's get into chapter one this chapter has five main sections that custom lineage system the artificer reprint all of those subclasses, along with optional bonus features for every single class, and some more feats. This first chapter here is what I'm doing a deep dive on in a few days, so make sure you subscribe and you don't miss it, because I'm also going to be giving away some books. And I'll be giving you guys a sneak peek of my own homebrew system that combines everything that I just said into one system. But we'll get into all that later, let's go. One of the things that excited me the most about Tasha's Cauldron of Everything were these character options, and it's because I've been using these for years. It was so cool to see Wizards of the Coast let people think outside the box, but I guess this would be now the box is bigger, so this is now inside the box, but you get the idea of releasing those restrictions of certain races getting certain things, and you can really, really make your own. So going through here now, we got some awesome art and stuff, customizing your origin, okay? Basically, this means that whenever you pick a race in any race that you choose, you can take those ability scores and put them wherever you want. You don't have to put that plus two to constitution in the constitution. You can put it wherever you want. And if you have a plus two and a plus one, you can put everything wherever you want. That's what the ability score crease means. Languages, of course, if you come from a different spot, it doesn't make sense that your character would know that language. You can switch any language to another one. Same thing here with proficiencies. If you don't feel that your character would be proficient in that, you can switch to something else. Then they also got this chart here for you, which switches one skill to another one you can swap out. But then for armor and martial weapons, you can basically take armor and martial weapons and swap them out for any martial weapon or simple weapon. And if you have a simple weapon or tool, you can swap that out for any other simple weapon or tool. So I guess this table could be organized a little better. And then, of course, your personality can be different. But now we have the custom lineage. And this was the part that I've been doing for years already. And I've spent about two years now working on this system that I'll get into in, again later in next week's video. But basically, you choose whatever type of creature you are. It's just basically like a variant human, but for anything. Because a lot of times I'd see people pick variant human and then just reskin the human to be something else. But this lets you actually choose a creature type, you select your size, and you select your speed. Me personally, I think the size and speed should be together, and you should either be small with 25 feet or medium with 30 feet. But you know, then you have an ability score increase, and it says pick one ability score and increase it by two. I personally would have it be you get two points to put wherever you want. If you want to put these two points in the same thing, go for it. Or if you want to split them out, go for it. Again, that's a small thing, but then you also get to choose a feat, and this is super exciting for a lot of people. You get a variable trait, you get to pick one of the following, which is only two options, of dark vision or a bonus proficiency of some kind. But I really do feel like there should be more options here for this variable besides just two. That's probably why I went and created my own system with probably too many options. 
Languages, of course, is the same thing as what I just said. Now, for this part, we have changing a skill or changing your subclass. And in general, my first reaction to this was that I didn't like it because you are that class and you have this whole story that you've been telling about you being this subclass and having these skills. So for me, this does seem strange to just change to where now you can't do that thing anymore, but they do go into training time and a sudden change that does make sense. At least for me in my games, whenever a character goes through some sort of change mechanically with some abilities that they can do or skills I guess they're proficient in, I want there to be a story there to explain why they're able to do this thing now or not able to do this thing. But I really do like that this does open up a good conversation between players and DMs that if players aren't feeling like their character is being played in the way that they want them to or they want to be able to have access to different stuff, they can talk about this and maybe start trying to swap some things out. But in general for myself, I would add things onto it. Because if you're proficient in athletics, I wouldn't make sense for them to just not be proficient in athletics anymore unless something happened. So my homebrew fix for this is my bonus level up system where every single time a player levels up, I give them an extra little bonus perk. Sometimes it is a skill where if they've really shown throughout that previous level leveling up that they're working on something, whether it's performance or deception, they've been lying a lot. Whenever they level up, I give them for the proficiency that they wanted or some cool custom feature. I think doing that as a DM has let me reward my players for playing the character the way they want and empower them to keep playing the character the way they want. But if things get too out of hand and you really feel like your character is too, too far away from these small little changes, maybe you can have this big sudden change. Going into the next chapter. Oh, the Artificer. Yeah, I never even had the Artificer from Eberron, so this is actually really nice for me to be able to have an actual resource for an Artificer now. And now for every single class, they have the optional class features, which is basically when in the player's handbook, at certain levels, you get certain things. This gives you an option to choose a different thing instead of that thing if you don't feel like that fits your character. I'm always down for more options. And then they go into the subclasses of all the different stuff that they have for each of these subclasses. If you guys want me to do full blown deep dives on some of these subclasses, you gotta let me know. Cause in general, I'm not gonna go into every single one of these subclasses cause, <laughs> cause there's so many of them. And in general, I have more homebrew stuff that I do instead of one specific subclass. But what I am gonna do after this main stint of Tasha's videos is done is do a Path of Wild Magic Barbarian because it is my favorite subclass. I have some homebrew tweaks that I make to it and I have an entire D300 homebrew wild magic search table that i made every single one of but that's going to be for a later video so we're going to go back to the table of contents now and go to the actual thing overall there's all those subclasses my goodness feats i'll also talk about in that custom video let's get to chapter two group patrons were something that i was unfamiliar with before this book's release i know it's been out there before but this is basically whenever your group is a part of a group they are underneath and working for some higher entity above them and it gives a whole bunch of different examples here the book goes into how they actually work, which is pretty simple. You do stuff and you get stuff. The biggest thing I did not know here is about this group assistance thing. This is an actual mechanical advantage in the game in the form of advantage that your party can give each other. If your party's working for this group patron, anyone within that group can grant advantage to another person once per long rest, assuming that they can see and hear them. I really like this because this hits on that team unity thing and really lets them work together again. And like I said a second ago, this advantage thing, you can help and stack together. Going on through now, of course, this group would offer perks in some kind, which is going to change for each one. Assignments, this is a little quest that they can go on. Yes, example patrons, this is what we're going to get into now. Basically, what or who is your party working for? I'm going to do a full dive into this for my second video over group patrons. But for the overview here, each of these group patrons breaks down into five different categories. The first one, once you've selected it, is type. What type of ancient being are you working for? And then you go into perks of what types of benefits did this party gain? Why would they want to be in this group in the first place? Then you have some sort of contact that you're able to talk with one-on-one. -on -one. Then there's the position or the title that you have within the group that you can obviously work your way up through. And then overall at the very end, there's quests. What quests do they send you out on? And then the whole thing ends with being your own patron, which I think is a great concept if a group wants to actually flip the tables and them run the group. But I'll be getting all that in its own video. Next capture here we have is Magic Miscellany, which is all the magic stuff in Chapter 3. We got a bunch of new spells, and they entirely redid all the summoning stuff. Let me get all those spells in one thing here so you can see them all. There you go. There's 14 of them if you take all those summon spells and condense them into one. But I'll be going through each one of these in its own spell video. Very similar to how Davy Chappie does his spell videos. He's another DC YouTuber. Eh? Davy Chappie DC. Yeah? He's another D&D YouTuber with a fast-paced, funny channel with a lot of great tips, too. And just maybe, I might be a part of a collaboration he's doing that's going to blow your minds. It's going to set a D&D YouTube record. But getting back into the spells, I'm not going to go through every single one of these in this video, but the cool thing I do want to talk about is personalizing spells. 
This is yet another thing that I've already been doing for years. So I really feel synced up to Tasha's book in this way. But I love that they're putting this out there to inspire more people to get creative and do this thing. This basically just changes the visual aesthetic of what your spells look like and customizes them to you. How does you casting the spell shield compared to someone else? If you're a fiery sorcerer, maybe it's a small wall of fire right in front of you to protect you. Maybe an abjuration wizard has a literal blue barrier that you can kind of see through. Classic. Or what if you're a conjuration wizard? Maybe you conjurate a suit. Con conjurate? Is that a word? Maybe you conjure up a suit of armor on yourself that gives you 5 AC. So cool and personalized. But this is the homebrew ball that I'm going to take and run with in its own video. I also do got to show you this though. It's a magic missile chicken picture. That's just so, so great. A farmer sorcerer magic missile chickens. All right. So the next chapter after magic, we get into magic items. And there are a lot of magic items here. Way more than I thought there would be. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Magic items though, for me, I usually homebrew from scratch all of my magic items. So this will be a great source of inspiration for me. But I don't see myself doing a full video on that. But if you want to see what I would do that, leave a comment down below. I, I don't know. But what I am so excited about are magic tattoos. And again, this is something that I've already been doing in my games as well. Matthew Mercer from Critical Role had his own tattoo system. that I didn't really know the inner working mechanics of, so I created my own and put it into my city. So the way I run them is a lot different than how these do. Because these tattoos, if you read, um, it's a needle that has some sort of enchant on it. And you hold it over the person and it whew, turns into a tattoo. I see this as more of a trade skill that I'm going to get into more in that video and add some more homebrew tattoos myself. But if you're talking character customization, this book is next level giving not only can you take your character and do whatever race and lineage that you want from it, you can tweak and change all of those things. Then we already went into changing your subclass and skills around as you play, which is very dynamic. Love that. And we just talked about personalizing your spells, customizing those. Now you can customize your body with some magic ink. But I will say a strange thing here that I understand mechanically why they did it is that you have to attune to tattoos. I'd call it a tattoonment. That's probably the best joke I've done. After magic items now, we have Dungeon Master's Tools. I just want to say that I love this chapter so much that they took an additional supplement on top of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Don't get me wrong, the DMG is a great resource to help players become Dungeon Masters. But there is so much to this game with the endless customizable options, so this just takes that and runs with it. Which I'm going to then take and run with myself. Man, that's a lot of running. Don't worry, I'm doing it, I'm doing it for you. So these chapters here off to the side, Session Zero, Sidekicks, Parlaying with Monsters, which I'm going to get into too, Environmental Hazards, I'll be doing full videos on as well. The first thing to go into is Session Zero here, and it's actually funny, the first video I posted on this channel that was an actual video was Session Zero. So if you want to see an exactly one year ago me go through a breakdown and take probably longer than I need to to say everything I did, I should redo that Session Zero video. So the first thing it gets into is character party creation. I would always recommend to do a session zero before you start a campaign of any kind, however long. This gets everyone on the same page so that they know how they know each other. Which this also gets into as far as party formation. Are any of the characters related to each other? What keeps the characters party together? Does the group have a group patron? Which we also talked about. You can also do cool things here as, as they're sitting around the table. How do you know the person's character to your left? I even as a DM like to give cool extra bonus stuff in the form of maybe some sort of item or some sort of bonus perk or some sort of bonus proficiency maybe even if the players have cool connections with each other. So they keep things smooth and rolling. And then you have the party's origin. You can kind of help with where they came from. Did a festival bring them together where the characters overcome some sort of foe? which also gets into how to start your campaign, which I also have a full video on. This part was interesting too, running a game for one player. Super awesome. Then you got the social contract, which is huge. It's this unspoken thing that sometimes needs to be spoken about what the expectations are to be able to respect everyone. And I was impressed because this book also goes into the soft and hard limits of what people are comfortable or uncomfortable with. And moving on through to the end, you have game customization of how you will implement house rules at your game table. But for real, this part is huge, and I know I do a ton of homebrew stuff, but as I say a lot, you should customize what homebrews you use with what your players are comfortable with. And to answer this question, I get asked a lot of how much homebrew is too much, however much it confuses people. Homebrew should make the game easier or more fun, and as soon as the homebrews stop doing that, or there's so many of them that it starts getting confusing, that's when it's too much. Which is why I try and keep all my homebrews nice and simple. Next section here is on sidekicks, and this is something I was really excited for them to take from the D&D Essentials Kit and bring it into a full-blown book. I had my own homebrew solution for this, but I really like the amount of structure that this gave because my homebrew is a little bit amorphous and a little bit more difficult to try and give as a tip to somebody else, but this really helps with that. I'll go into more of that on the sidekick video, but you can create a sidekick, which is perfect for an NPC that you want to bring along with the party, or you could have a player character play this thing. 
The best way I've used it in that situation was I had a brand new player that wanted to play with their friends who had already been in the campaign, so I brought them in as a sidekick. But in general, this gives a stat block and structure to how your players can actually run an NPC. Again, there's a lot to this that's really cool, and I'll get into that more specifically in the other videos. The next section here is really cool called parlaying with monsters. What does parlay mean? It means your players aren't murder hobos and just kill everything in front of them. So this section will probably not be useful to you at all because that's all players ever do. <laughs> no, but for real, this is something that's absolutely huge to stop players from being murder hobos. It gives some sort of personality to these monsters that they have more than going on than just kill everything. You can research about the monsters through the different type of intelligence checks and you have monsters desires. Now they give D4 tables for all of these and there's so much more that you can do with this, but I love that that's, that's all that they needed to do is just give a little bit of pinch of inspiration that you can also look through all of these tables and steal for the other ones as well. Beasts want fresh meat, a soothing melody, brightly colored beads, an odd stuffed animal or other trinket. And if they get this thing, you don't have to fight them and kill them. The player should interact with the world and think about the world instead of just murdering it. Although this one was really cool, where is it for fiends? Here it is, your soul. Okay, maybe I'll have to fight for that one. But this also reminds me of the witchery monster video that I just did. Instead of having your players have to learn about things of how to kill the monster, they could learn about things on how to avoid killing the monster. How to pacify it, and maybe even turn it onto their side. Super cool stuff, getting into environmental hazards now. Now this section right here, I was really impressed with because I love each of these. You have supernatural regions, which speaks to me so much because I'm a, I'm a big plains person. I have an entire... PDF homebrew that I give all my patrons that have every single plane of existence flushed out with different inner working mechanics. And this really felt like that. These supernatural regions get into different places that have blessed radiance, the far realm. That's huge. There's not much documentation on the farm realm. A haunted place that's all spooky. A mirrored zone that has like illusions and different things spawn. It, it, it was really cool. Oh, and I gotta say this, my favorite supernatural reason is unraveling magic. It's basically an area where magic itself is ripping apart and unpredictable. They even give you an unraveling magic effects table here that's very similar to a wild magic surge table, which also speaks to me just at my core. You might roll on this thing anytime a charge of a magic item is used, you use a first level spell slot or higher, or this was cool, a dragon, fey, or elemental creature of challenge rating five or higher dies. This book is just sparking so much creativity. This gets you thinking so far outside the box that you're in other realms of existence. So I want to know what you guys, do you guys want to see entire videos on supernatural regions, per, uh, magical phenomena, which is, I'll get into in a second, and natural hazards, because I could definitely do all three. Or I could do a faster one and pack it all into one. I want to know what you guys think down in the comments. So that's supernatural regions, but magical phenomena is different, like an eldritch storm. How cool is that? You also got things like emotional echoes or enchanted springs. These are basically all different effects, which you don't have to go to another realm of existence for, like the supernatural regions thing we just talked about. This is something that's happening usually for a temporary amount of time in a certain location. I don't know, there's just so many cool things in here, like mimic colonies. That's an entire place where every single thing you see is a mimic. You yourself as a dungeon master would know that, but the players have to figure that out. So many different cool things you can throw at your players. And speaking of stuff to throw at your players, you got natural hazards. And what's funny is I also feel synced up to Tasha's Cauldron of Everything in this way because they have avalanches and falling into water, which I do differently and I have my own homebrew system that I talked about in another video and in my Icewind Dale Arctic Survival PDF. But this also goes into falling on a creature where you share damage if you fall on another creature, which I love that. Uh, spell equivalents to national ha national has natural hazards of different spells. We have a blizzard spell. It could be Kona Cold, Ice Storm, Sleet Storm. All of this stuff is already existing in the game. So now for the final chapter in this awesome cauldron of everything is puzzles. I have been working on for a while now videos on puzzles, traps, and riddles because I think they're huge and there's so much to offer as help for players. And then this book comes along and does it again. I feel like I should work for Wizards of the Coast now. I'll be doing my full video on puzzles too, but this gets into why are the puzzles, puzzles elements, difficulty, puzzle features, the solution, and how you should handle the solution. Hints and different things you can give your players along the way with clues and customizing the puzzle to your party. The odd and creepy eerie thing again is that a lot of the things that I was building out as the outline for my video are laid out here too. And it also goes into giving different hints on how to run puzzles and then running puzzles yourself. And then I love that they actually go into giving you 13 different puzzles that you can run yourself. Skeleton keys, elusive island, exact change. And the very last thing they go into is puzzle handouts, which this is also huge, is giving out actual tangible things to your party members that they can either use to solve the puzzle or that they get to be able to see so that it makes sense in their heads when they're looking at it. So there it is, guys. That is everything inside of Tasha's cauldron of everything. 
What do you guys think? Are you guys excited? I want to know down in the comments. Let me know what you guys want to see because I'm about to make a bunch of videos that follow up this thing and I can answer your questions there. But for myself here, what would I give this thing as the DC? <laughs> what would I set the DC at for this book? A DC of one would be you should definitely not buy this book. Do not get it. It's useless. A DC of five would be is if things that I said speak to you and you really like this type of stuff, then you should get it. And a DC of 10 is, oh my God, everyone needs this book. So personally, I would set the DC here at nine. And I'll say this too, to be completely transparent, it's only a nine because this is the first book review I've done like this. So I feel like I shouldn't give it a 10 because you know, the first rating being a 10 really, <laughs> I feel like it's not allowed. But now there's at least some wiggle room to see if any book in the future can dethrone Tasha's Cauldron. But for real, I do think this book is an amazing book. It's for players, it's for dungeon masters, it's for the entire group. Even just one person at your group having this book takes your game to another level because it gives so many different customizable options to the players. Whether you're creating your player, playing through your character, different subclasses for your characters. And then you have the entire group patron thing that I thought was super cool that I didn't even know about before this. Dungeon Masters have their, no, magic. There's so many different things from magic with magic tattoos, spells, magic items. Dungeon Masters have entire inspirational resources that have to do with supernatural regions, magical phenomena, environmental hazards, puzzles. There's just so much stuff that has inspired me to make more videos to help inspire you guys and take this stuff and run with it. So now it is 3 a.m. here, guys, and I've got to get this video out, edit it, put it out. I'm not gonna be able to send this to my editor because I'm gonna turn around too quick, too fast. I'll post it, get it out to you guys, then I'll get some sleep. So if I don't comment right away, you know why. You know why. So check out those links in the description once I post them about everything else I've been brewing up for Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And if you like even more homebrew stuff, I just released my monthly homebrew PDF for November for my patrons. It's a purely homebrew PDF and has tons of magic items, cursed items, it has my paladin subclass that I created with that Arctic theme called Oath of the Rhyme. It's basically a paladin whose aura is a literal blizzard. Pretty cool. And it's also got a fighter subclass of a death knight that I think is super awesome and a five room dungeon that has a mysterious theme to it. I also recorded a full blown video that I attached to the PDF to give to my patrons too. So anyone that joins my Patreon in the month of November will get everything that I just said and any reward to the join on top of all the other stuff. And that reminds me I'm doing a huge 10,000 subscriber giveaway right now for everybody. And speaking of 10K, if you want to hit that 100K goal, it's time to dial things up to 11. So I'm going to be coming at you guys with more and more stuff. So stay tuned, stay creative, and think outside that box.